Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I'm glad to be back with you in this uh, Christian teaching. And this morning is going to be a good one. All Christian teachings are good teachings, uh, by the way. But this one I'm going to particularly really enjoy, as I enjoy them all. What does it mean to be a Christian in every aspect? What does it mean to be a Christian in every aspect? Because Christianity has been tied to so many things outside of the flesh. They've tried to scripturalize Christianity. They've tried to attach Christianity to the material things of the world and define, uh, define themselves as, as having material possessions, Christianity, and blessed. And, and this is all false. And it all gives people a false hope. What does it mean to be Christian in every aspect? That's the teaching we're about to get into. What does it mean to be Christian in every aspect? We're going to break this down in half. What does it mean to be Christian in the second half in every aspect? Number one, what does it mean to be Christian? Christian means Christ-like. Christian means Christ-like. It means to be in his image in the spirit. And bear his likeness in the flesh by the first fruit, by the first fruits of the spirit. Now, when we bear his likeness in the flesh by the first fruits of the spirit, that's the leading of the spirit. And in the leading of the spirit is where we as gospel men and women in the faith, we live. See, we live, we spiritually live in the fruit of his spirit. That That's, that's where you become an overcomer. Because Christ himself, Ephesians 4, 15, I mean, Hebrews 4.15, our high priest, was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So we overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil by the leading of the Spirit, by the living of the Spirit. Because once we're born of the Spirit, we have to enter into the living of the Spirit. So Christian means Christ-like. It means in his image in the Spirit and bear his likeness in the flesh according to the first fruit living of the Spirit. But this all happens through being born of the Spirit. This only happens through being born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be Christian in every aspect? It means in every aspect of the flesh, it comes back under the first fruit government of the Spirit. This is divine order being restored. Every aspect of of our malehood and femalehood in the flesh comes back under the government of the first fruit gospel man and woman in the spirit. This flesh has to be brought into subjection. It has to be brought into subjection because we being born dead in our sins and trespasses in the second heaven, Ephesians 6, 12, we're born in the flesh, dead in our sins and trespasses in the spirit. We have a flesh first mentality and that means we have a religious mentality. And when we're born back into the first heaven, where Satan was booted out of, Ephesians 1.3, where the spiritual blessings are, the heavenly places, which is the mind of Christ, when we're born back in that, into that dimension, the natural male and female has to be brought into subjection to the first fruit gospel of the man and woman to break that religious yoke, to break that religious mentality. Because religion is a hindrance to true Christianity. It's a hindrance to true Christianity. They've associated Christianity with the Bible, and Christianity is independent of the Bible. The Bible point was, was given by inspiration to point us back to the revelation. Christianity functions by revelation alone. Now, Christianity will confirm the letter in the teaching of the letter. In the teaching of the letter to know that that letter was of Christ, that the letter was of Christ. Uh, Christianity will confirm the scripture because it is the letter of Christ. But we go from the Bible of Christ to the gospel of Christ. That's where the life is. All right. So this is what it means to be Christian in every aspect. In every aspect of the flesh, we come back under the first fruit government of the spirit. And when we come back under the, the government of the Spirit, 
we go from that racial identity we had in the flesh. We go from that racial identity, because Christianity is non-racial. We go from that racial identity in the spirit of death back to that non-racial, non-gender identity in Christ, who is the spirit of life. Who is the spirit of life? We got indoctrinated with the doctrine of race at the fall. And we, when we got spiritually indoctrinated with the uh, doctrine of race within, in our spirit, it produced the fruit of segregation in the flesh, which is, which is the fruit of, seg uh, which is the fruit of Satan's spirit. We as a creation, a fallen creation, we got divided so that we could go to war against one another. And this is where all the racial hostility and racial hatred, this is where it all comes from. This comes from the root of death. This comes from the spirit of death. There are spiritual entities behind all these things, all this uh, racial hatred and these, these things that go on. There's spiritual wickedness behind this. Ephesians 6, 12. For we are, we war not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Race is the foundation of racism and it is spiritual wickedness. You're not warring against a white person or a black person because there's no such thing as a white person or a black person. That's a fallen identity. Your identity comes out of the deception of your whiteness or your blackness and it's put back in the non-racial, non-gender identity of Christ. Race puts a blinder on you. The gospel takes that blinder off of you. Someone operating in the deception of race, they see their truth, but they can't see the truth. They can't see the truth. So we go touch on what was the racial identity. Romans one twenty three. Remember, we, we being born dead in our sins and trespasses. Romans one twenty three. it says, For they took the image of the uncorruptible God and made it in the image of corruptible man. When we fell from the image of Christ in the spirit and we lost his likeness in the flesh, according to the fruit of the spirit, when we got racially indoctrinated, we took, we made a Christ in the image of ourself in the flesh according to our racial identity in the flesh. And you see this in, a, in, in these cultural churches, Bible-based churches that you might, might go into, where you might see the picture of the white Jesus or the black Jesus. That's something they identify with according to the flesh, according to their culture in the flesh. These cultural Christ, they're dangerous Christ. That's what it means to make God in your own image in the flesh, to have this false Christianity according to the flesh, which is not real. Romans 3, 9. It says, for we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, they're under sin. So it's talking about the racial identity. It's under sin and sin has already been judged to death under the law. So the end result of, of sin is death. And that racial identity is sin. That racial identity is sin and it has already been judged to death. So the death of Christ has to be applied supernaturally so that we die to that racial identity, that racial identity in the spirit of death, and we're made alive from that racial identity to our non-racial identity in the spirit of Christ. Now, where is our non-racial identity? Let's go to Galatians 3, 24 through 28. Galatians chapter 3, 24. 24 says, For the law was our schoolmaster under Christ, that we would be justified by faith. The law was our schoolmaster under Christ, that we would be justified by faith. The letter of the law, because the letter was given to us in the flesh while being dead in our sins and trespasses in the spirit. The letter of Christ, being gospel translated, was our schoolmaster unto the gospel of Christ that we would be justified by the faith of Christ. See, when we were given the letter, we were in that fallen racial identity. But the letter of Christ was to bring us to the gospel of Christ, back to our non-racial identity, that we would be justified by the faith of Christ. 25 says, 
But once faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Once you're born back into the faith of the spirit, you at liberty from that racial identity which Satan had you bound to in the flesh by the fruit of his spirit, which is the fruit of death. So we're at liberty. We're back in the faith. We're back in the faith. Um, here we go. Okay, wait a minute. 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ. But you have to be in Christ because Christ is the faith. So we're the children of God by the faith of Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For as many of us have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That means we're not being born of Christ, but when we're baptized back into the image of Christ in the spirit, we have put on Christ in the flesh according to the first fruit likeness of the spirit. So we're back spirit, soul, and body in our non-racial identity. Now we can bring light to those who sit in the spiritual darkness of that deception. You have to go back to that non-racial identity in Christ. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither Jew nor Greek because there's no race in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Race is a doctrine. It's not a color. The deception of it is that it's a color, but it's actually a doctrine. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. See, there's no Jew nor Greek in Christ because there's no race in Christ. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female. There's no male or female in Christ. The male or the female is the temple of the spirit. The man and the woman is in the spirit. It didn't say there was neither man or woman in Christ. There's neither male or female in Christ because flesh and blood cannot inherit that kingdom. Okay, the, the, the male and the female is the temple of Christ. But the man and the woman is in the gospel of Christ. It's the man in the gospel man and woman, the spiritual man and woman is in the gospel of Christ. For you are all the for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one in Christ. Because we're all one in the revelation of Christ. But yet it's not a we are the world mentality because although we're all one in Christ, we're all independent of one another by Christ. It's not a we are the world mentality, let's all lean on one another mentality. No, that, that's a church mentality. That is not in the gospel. We're all one in the body of Christ, but based on the fruit of the spirit, we're all independent, independent of one another because we, as in, we individually are reliant upon the person Christ. And every one of us must bear the fruit, which is the evidence of having our very own personal relationship with the Christ. With the true Christ. And the fruit got to bear witness that you got the true one. So we have to be restored back to our non-racial identity. Because Christ is neither Jew nor Greek. See, color is not race. The Adamic creation was of all colors. Was of all shades. But there was no race. There was no race. God, God created color, but he didn't create race. And if you just want a picture of it, just look at horses. Just using that for an example. Horses have different colors, but horses have no races. There's no such thing as horses have no race. Horses only identify with one another as horses. Because they... they Horses cannot be racially indoctrinated. <laughs> we as a fallen creation got racially indoctrinated. But we have to be set free from that. We have to go from that racial identity back to our non-racial identity. Anyone that professes Christianity and uh, is still identifying themselves as a black person or a white person, that's bad fruit. That's not, that's not true Christian fruit.
because you're delivered from that deception and your spiritual eyes are opened. So if you're professing that you're Christian and Christian means Christ-like and you're still identifying yourself as a white person or black person in the world, then what you have is a, is a religious type of Christianity. You've, you've attached Christianity to the Bible and you've scripturalized a Christianity that fits what you believe in your culture. That's dangerous. That's deadly dangerous. Let us get into uh, part one. Part one of this uh, short teaching. We had to go through what it is to be Christian, what it means to be Christian. Christian means Christ-like. It doesn't mean going to church or anything else. When you become Christian, you become independent of the flesh. Church and religion is of the flesh. You become independent of the flesh because you're separated unto God in the spirit. When the Lord says, be separated unto me, that's by the power of his spirit through being born of the spirit. That's not isolating yourself from everybody else in the flesh. That's not what that means. It means to be born back in, into his spirit by the power of his spirit and he leading you it, into a lost and dark world by the light of his spirit, by the first fruit light of his spirit. Let's go to Colossians 1.27. Colossians 1.27 says that this is the mystery among you Gentiles. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So where is Christ? How do you become Christ-like? Through Christ being in you as a male or female, you becoming his temple, the temple of his spirit. But as a born-again uh child of God, you in his spirit. So you can spiritually mature back up. You can spiritually mature as a new believer and become Christian, become Christ-like. Because you have to become a true believer, which is a new believer, before you can spiritually mature into what it means to be Christ-like. And you go, when that happens, you're going to be independent of all the nonsense that goes on out there with their associate with Christianity. You'll be able to expose it, not only expose it, they're going to see the first fruits of true Christianity in you, and you're going to be walking independent of that in the light of Christ. Romans 8, 9. So you see, this is the hope of glory, Christ in you. Not you in church, but Christ in you. And you being restored back to his image in the spirit. So... You can bear his likeness and enter into his leading by the first fruit, by the first fruits of the spirit, which is the living of the spirit. You have to enter into that Christ-like living, which is that, that Christ lifestyle, which is in the fruit of the spirit. Anything outside of that is not a lifestyle. It's a dead style. Anything that binds you to the flesh is not a lifestyle. It's a dead style because the end of it will be death. Romans 8, 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Nine. The, um, same verse. Now, if any have not the spirit of Christ, they're none of his. This eliminates everything else. This, el this eliminates you uh, with all the, the Bible-based religious activities. It sets you free from all that. If you do not have the spirit of Christ, you're none of his. You don't belong to him. I don't care how much you quote scripture. I don't care how much you stay in the church. I don't care how uh, uh, biblically religious you are. I don't care how much you profess being a Christian. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're none of his. You're just putting on a dog and pony show. You are none of his. You don't belong to him. John 4, 24. God is the spirit. And they that walk with him. Oftentimes we say God is the spirit. And that's true. That's the truth. Because it's, it's, it's scripture. It's pointing us to the spirit. And they that walk with him must walk with him in spirit and in truth. But it's really God is the spirit. And they that walk with him must walk with him in the spirit and in the truth. So the three those have to be there. He's the spirit. And we must walk with him in, in the spirit and in the truth. 
He's not in the spirit. He is the spirit. That's the difference. God, he's not, he, Christ is not in the spiritual realm. He is the spiritual realm. Because the whole spiritual realm was created by him. He's not in eternity. He is eternity. Eternity is not his home. Eternity is who he is. Eternity is his nature. That's not his home. That's his nature. We were created for eternity. Christ is eternity. So we that walk with him must walk with him in the spirit and in the truth. And God is love. So this makes God's love conditional to the mind of Christ, which is the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of God. So God's love is conditional to Christ. If you're in Christ, you experience his unconditional love. But if you're outside of Christ, that love becomes conditional because you're under the law. You're outside of that love and you're in danger of being judged by the law. You want to be judged by grace. There's no mercy in the law. The mercy is in grace. John 3.3, 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born of the Spirit. You must be born of the Spirit. I bet Nicodemus was pretty confident. Why would he tell Nicodemus he must be born of the Spirit when Christ was right in front of him? Because Christ was in front of Nicodemus in the flesh. He had the sin of the world upon him in the flesh. So Nicodemus was looking at a Christ in his image and likeness in the flesh. But he, Nicodemus could not see Christ in his non-racial, non-gender glory of the spirit. This is why he told Nicodemus, you must be born of the spirit. Or you cannot see nor understand the, the, the things of the kingdom of God. Remember Peter. Peter was quite prejudiced at times. Because Peter, Peter was walking with a Jesus in his cultural likeness in the flesh. Remember, Jesus had that racial identity on himself. That is the sin of the world. He had that racial identity on himself. But what happened when Peter saw Jesus on the mount in his non-racial, non-gender identity? He saw, he saw Jesus in his glory. It says Peter was so afraid that he didn't even know what to say. Peter was so afraid that he didn't even know what to say. It says, he says, Lord, Lord, shall we not build a tabernacle for you, Moses and, and Elijah? And scripture says, for he was so afraid, he knew not what he was saying. Because when he saw Jesus in his righteousness, in that non-racial, non-gender, eternal glory, and he saw him in that, in, in the filth of race, he saw judgment. And that judgment terrified him. It terrified him because race has already been judged to death under the law. Now, Peter was pretty confident when before that, when he was in the flesh and he was walking with Jesus in the flesh, not knowing that Jesus had the sin of the world upon himself. Why are you talking to that woman at the well? She's not one of us. Why are you talking to that Gentile? So oftentimes in the letter, it showed Peter reflecting cultural prejudice. And when we're walking in false Christianity, that's what it also does with us. That prejudice, that bias, even in sometimes racism, it gets justified through a false Christianity. There is no such thing as white Christianity or black Christianity. There is no such thing as white love or black love. There is no such thing as a white faith or a black faith. Pray to be delivered from that. You have to be delivered from that. You either going to die to it or you're going to die in it. Don't die in it. You, you, you better pray for deliverance receive, so you can receive Christ's death so you can die to it, to sin, and then by his life, which is in the spirit, have all power over sin spirit, soul, and body, and enjoy the blessed life, which is the Christ life. Okay, once we're born of the Spirit, as he told Nicodemus he must be born of the Spirit, you come under the anointing of the Spirit. <clears throat> 1 John 2.27. 1 John 2.27, we come under the anointing of the Spirit.
1 John 2, 27. We come under the anointing of the Spirit. But the anointing which you have received, that's those born of the Spirit. The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. That's mankind in the flesh. That any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is the truth, and is no lie, and even as it had taught you, you shall abide in him. As you receive revelation of the Spirit, you you go abide in that revelation. The revelation of the Spirit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, and as you abide in it, you become more fruitful and more fruitful. You just don't continue to walk in the revelation because there can be no relationship with Christ without first revelation from Christ. Because your relationship with Him, He has to initiate. Initiate. He's the author and completion of that relationship. That relationship is is initiated in his spirit by the power of his spirit and the completion of that relationship is the fruit of the spirit because if you ain't being led by the spirit you're not in relationship with Christ in the spirit you, you might be in some religion but you're not in relationship and of course there's a space to go between being led of the spirit being born of the spirit and you go through the process of being led of the spirit that's the living Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Once we're in the anointed places in the Spirit, we're, we're in Christ. We're, in, we're under that anointing. We're in the heavenly places. We are in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Put the emphasis on spiritual blessings. Who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. That is the mind of Christ. That is the spirit of Christ. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. You're either spiritually blessed or you're spiritually cursed. And the next teaching, the next series that I'm coming with is going to be making I'm going to be teaching the difference between being spiritually blessed and spiritually cursed there's evidence the spiritual blessings proceed material wealth material wealth follows the spiritual spiritual blessings that's where you know it's the true Christ when you're spiritually cursed material blessings are outside of the Material blessings are outside of the spiritual blessings. They don't follow them. They're in the place of them. That's when you're spiritually cursed. Because you're calling materialism prosperity. Materialism is not prosperity. Materialism has to come under the government of prosperity. But outside of the leading of prosperity, materialism becomes a substitute for, for prosperity. This is how you separate the spiritually cursed from the spiritually blessed. The spiritually blessed. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. Those spiritual blessings are in Christ. Those blessings restore you back to his image in the spirit and they translate into the flesh by the first fruit likeness of the spirit, which is the living and leading of the spirit. Our living is beyond money. Because... Our living as gospel men and women is superior to money. And money will come under the stewardship of our prosperity. But to the gospel man and woman, we are in delight. We know money is not prosperity. Okay. Those that think money is prosperity, they are still dead in their sins and trespasses. They're in the letter of Christ. They're not in the gospel of Christ. They are not in the gospel of Christ. According as he had chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame, blameless before him in love. To be before him in love, you have to be before him in, in spirit. And love is not walking around telling everybody I love you and I love everybody. I don't love everybody. Love is not loving everybody. 
Love, love is a that's that's religious people say that the love of Christ is what he's talking about here. Being in love before him, in the love of Christ before him. Now I love people that I don't know with a gospel love. Because they either have the gospel or they don't have it. You have to love people with a gospel love, but you don't personally love everybody. That's nonsense. Okay, let us go to Ephesians 3.10. Ephesians 3.10. It says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, not the high places, that's where spiritual darkness dwells. To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. When you're in the gospel body, what's in the flesh? The biblical church. Now, Christ instituted the biblical church, and it was for a time and a season. We're outside of that age now. We're in the dispensation of the gospel of Christ. So now the manifold wisdom of God must be brought to the biblical church because they don't have it. They don't have it and they're going to fight you like crazy because they don't want it because it's a threat. It's a threat to the labor of the flesh. It's a threat to, to those church positions. It's a threat to a lot of these Bible-based church pastors because their, their leadership is at stake. Their, their prestige as being looked upon as something higher up is at stake. Because once that those people come under the anointing of Christ, you being looked at as something higher up, that's over. Because how they saw you in the dark, they're going to now see you differently in the light. They're going to now see you differently in the light. If, if you are a spiritual leader or you claim to be one, and you have people following you, that's a big problem right there because they're not supposed to be following you. They're supposed to be following the leader, the leading of Christ through you, not you. And then come into the place where, where they become independent of you because they're standing on their own fruit with Christ. As they spiritually mature, when they immature in the spirit, they may follow you. But as they mature in the spirit, they're going to be connected to you, but they're going to be, begin to walk independent of you. Because Christian means Christ-like. It means total dependency on Christ. We are all Christ-like. We are not Christ. So what business does anyone have needing us? What business does anyone have needing us? If someone needs you, you are not a Christian. And you have failed them. Because you have brought, you have become a crush to them. You know, there's a lot of people out here, they have to feel needed to feel important. And there's nothing more that they'd love to become a crutch to you. To have some type of self-worth toward themselves. You know where my value is? My value is in you not needing me. Not in you needing me. True Christianity is founded on the foundation of Christ in the image of the Spirit. You restored back to the image of the spirit and you're set at liberty from the flesh by the first fruit likeness, leading and living of the spirit. You become a powerful intimate. You become a powerful entity right here on planet Earth. You become a force to be reckoned with. But we all got to get to that place and there's a process to getting there. I love you and I thank you. And I look forward to uh, being with you in part two and three of this teaching. See you next time. Love you in Christ.